Order, please. Uh, we are now moving on to questions to the Minister for the Environment. I need to inform members that questions 2, 8 and 11 have been withdrawn. We will start with listed questions, and I call Mr Ian Milne. Mr Milne. Uh, Kester Hain, the whole question number one. Minister. The number of single wind turbine applications approved from 2005 to the 31st of January this year is 2,212. This is currently my department's latest available provisional renewable energy information. This figure is for applications approved and does not necessarily equate to the number of single wind turbines constructed and operational, as the Department does not hold information on whether the permission has been implemented. The figures may also include renewals of planning permissions and changes to existing approvals and may therefore equate to less than 2,212 individual sites. Applications for single wind turbines are determined taking into account all relevant planning considerations. Considerations include a wide range of factors, including the potential impacts on public safety, human health, residential amenity, landscape and cumulative impacts. The details of each application, including the site characteristics, locality and height of turbines, will differ, and therefore each application is determined in its, on its own particular locational merits. I recognise going forward that it is important that the right balance is struck between facilitating wind energy development in appropriate locations, whilst also protecting the exceptional quality of our natural environment. These are matters and issues that I have considered in finalising the strategic planning policy statement. Thank you. Mr. Milne for supplementary. Thanks, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Uh, Minister, uh, do you propose to set a threshold you know, um, for single wind turbines, say, in, uh, in uh, each council area, or what means of control do you, do you, do you imagine that you will set to control, uh, the, if you like, the, uh, the blight of uh, Single wind turbines in the countryside. Uh, I'd like to thank the member for the question and supplementary. As the member will be aware, as all members will be aware, hope, or should be aware, as of the 1st of April, the vast majority of planning powers was uh, transferred from my department, the DOE, to the 11 new councils. Now, while the department will still retain overarching planning policy responsibility, including the responsibility for planning policy statement 18, or now the SPPS, and uh, policy for re renewable energies. I believe it is only right and proper that local councils will have autonomy, or at least a fair degree of autonomy, when it comes to deciding what works, what will work in their area, and what their area needs. Therefore. I certainly do not have any intention of introducing a threshold or a limit on the amount of wind turbines that may be erected in one particular area, as I would not have a, a, any intention of introducing a threshold on the number of houses in any particular uh, council area. One threshold that does exist, however, or that I, I have brought forward, is that any renewable energy application over the threshold of 30 megawatts will be it won't be dealt with by the uh, relevant local council it will be retained centrally by the department as this would be deemed as a major or regionally significant application given its scale well, mr colum eastwood thank you mr deputy speaker uh, can i ask the minister uh, on, for an update on the finalization of the spps Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank Mr. Eastwood for that question. The final draft of the SPPS was completed last month following a period of extensive engagement with key planning stakeholders. My aim is to publish the SPPS in final form in the very near future following executive committee consideration. 
When it is published in final form, the provisions of the SPPS must be taken into account in the preparation of local development plans by the 11 new councils and are also to be material or will be material to all decisions on individual planning applications and appeals. It is very important that the SPPS is in place as soon as possible to provide the policy framework for the new two-tier planning system and, in particular, to enable the new councils to get on with the very important work of preparing their local development plans. Pending its publication, the existing suite of planning policy statements and relevant provisions of the planning strategy for rural Northern Ireland shall continue to apply as a temporary arrangement. Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, getting back to the wind turbines, I wonder could the Minister uh, advise if there has been any progress in securing cooperation with NIE on getting the um, connection costs agreed early on in the process so that people can see if they can actually go ahead? I thank the member for that question. And the issue of grid connection is one that has been raised uh, largely from the industry itself as being a major problem for them in uh, so slowing down uh, development of wind farms and single wind turbines. The, the member will be aware that while I have responsibility for planning, I do not have responsibility for energy. So problems with or associated with NIE and grid connections would be better directed towards uh, the Deity Minister the next time uh, the, 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 the member gets an opportunity. It is something that is very important. I know there are quite a number of wind farms in the system that have received planning approval, but however, as of yet, have not been able to secure grid connection. And it kind of skews our figures when we are talking about at meeting renewable energy targets, because although one has received plan and approval, there may be no realistic prospect of it actually being connected. So I do share the, the, the member's concerns. I, I think it's something that we do need to look at strategically. In other jurisdictions, Scotland, for example, they do it the other way around, and planning permission won't be awarded to a renewable energy project unless it has a guaranteed grid connection. So, like I say, I think that's something we certainly do need to look at, and I will look at in conjunction with the Deity Minister and others. Mr. Jerry Kelly for the <coughs> question. Three, uh, question three, please. In common with the approach in the other devolved administrations, my department's planning policy statement 18, <coughs> Renewable Energy, recommends the use of the assessment and rating of noise from wind farms, or ETSU R97 standard, and the assessment and rating of noise from wind energy developments. This standard describes a methodology for the assessment and rating of noise from wind energy development that provides protection to wind farm neighbours without placing unreasonable restrictions upon appropriate wind energy development. ETSU R97 deals only with the assessment and rating of noise and does not provide guidance with the assessment and in relation to the assessment of shadow flicker. Sorry. Advice on shadow flicker and reflected light is set out within the associated best practice guidance to PPS 18. While I recognise that ETSU R97 is currently the established UK-wide standard in relation to the assessment of noise, I am aware that it has attracted some criticism. I also acknowledge that the Environment Committee, in their recent report on the outcome of their inquiry into wind energy, recommended that my department should review the use of ETSU R97. As a result of those concerns and in response to the recommendation of the committee, I am considering further investigation of the use of ETSU R97 here in the north. I aim to complete an urgent review of strategic policy on renewable energy following the publication of the SPPS and during 2015-16, and I will consider this matter as part of that review. Well, Mr. Kelly, for supplement. Uh, go on, weakest lesson. I really have a fragile good issue. Thank you, Minister, for his answer up to now. And uh, he says he's going to do a review. Can he uh, give us some indication of when? 
Uh, he, he plans the update. I notice you, you said uh, 15, 16 uh, in terms of the noise control regulations. Do you have a date for that? Will it be done within this mandate? Or? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, Mr Kelly for the question. When I heard I was going to be asked a question about my assessment of ETSU, it was going to be that he hasn't done that much for Everton since he came on loan from Chelsea. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> the member's uh, question now uh, uh, around my review, or the, the review that I have pledged of PPS 18, that's the wider renewable energy policy. I very much intend to do that this year, obviously this being my last year, potentially as, as, as Minister for the Environment. It has always been my intention that following the publication of the strategic planning policy statement, that each component of that statement would be subject to full comprehensive review. It is my intention that the first components of that review will be the more controversial <laughs> aspects of it, namely PPS 18 pertaining to uh, renewable energy and PPS 21, uh, with which the, the members more rural <laughs> colleagues are very well acquainted. However, I have to wait until the SPPS is published, until I can proceed with these reviews. The SPPS is currently awaiting approval by the Executive. I call Mr Patsy McGlone for a question. Uh, Kesha, question number four. Climate change is one of the key societal challenges of the 21st century, with transport, business and agriculture all contributing to greenhouse gas emissions in Northern Ireland. I am committed to bringing forward a climate change bill in the next Assembly, and my department is also being proactive in seeking to address this challenge through innovative regulatory practices in advance of any legislative instruments. Prosperity agreements are voluntary agreements through which the NIEA and an organisation can realise opportunities for reducing the environmental impacts of energy and material use in ways that create prosperity and well-being. To address the challenge of climate change requires a business and regulators to take a radical new approach. Companies need to change the way they operate and to recognise the environment as an opportunity rather than a barrier. This requires a partnership approach with the regulator. The first agreement signed with Linden Foods included a target to reduce carbon emissions from the company's operations by a staggering 25 per cent through investment in new refrigeration equipment. Prosperity agreements support responsible businesses who seek to move beyond minimum compliance and harness market value from innovation. A prosperity agreement can also enable the Department to leverage sector-wide change influencing the supply chain, in this case the agricultural sector, to take action on reducing their carbon footprint. The recently signed agreement with the Forest Tarmac includes the commitment to use alternative fuels in their cement kiln, helping to reduce fossil fuel dependency and use former waste materials as a resource. All future prosperity agreements will also include actions relating to climate change adaptation or mitigation. Call Mr. McGlone for a supplementary. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his comprehensive reply. Can the Minister give us some uh, more detail about the uh, prosperity agreement uh, which exists with Lafarge in Cookstown, please? Just how it works, when it came in, that type of detail. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The second prosperity agreement was signed with the Farge Tarmac on the 5th of March this year and focuses on the innovative use of waste derived fuels to secure jobs and better environmental outcomes at their Cookstown plant and the members' own constituency, of course. The agreement is a public document and is available on the Lafarge Tarmac and the NIEA websites. Details of the agreement include that the Farage Tarmac will reduce fossil fuel or coal dependence by 35 per cent through alternative fuel substitution. The Farage Tarmac will reduce its total carbon emissions from production by a minimum of 10 per cent. That is equivalent to taking 
six and a half thousand cars off the road. That's, that's how big an impact we're talking here. We're also exploring options for reuse of known Northern Ireland waste streams, for example, gypsum, chicken litter, meat and, and bone meals, and tyres, and that's obviously going to reduce the amount of waste to landfill. The FARGE will examine options to reduce emissions from transport, including their haulage, supply chain and staff. There will also be improved public access to key European geological features that are found in the Bally Southern ASSI located within the Cookstown Quarry. It is also worth noting that the FARGE have undertaken to work with key stakeholders to develop a renewable energy strategy and examine further options to reduce uh, packaging. So uh, I think these are very responsible actions that this company are taking. And, uh, but they are not doing them sheerly for the environmental benefit. They can clearly see, and these prosperity agreements highlight, the fact that there can be win-wins. What is good for economics can also be good for the environment. Well, Mr. Cappelboyne, and for supplementary. Asking Colin Argus going break his election era and talk to Lagra. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I'm going to thank the Minister for his answer. But could I ask the Minister uh, how does the powers that is transferred to local authority assist local authority in tackling climate change itself for a new model? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank Mr. Boylan for that question. Obviously, uh, the 11 new councils or the restructuring of local government wasn't about just reducing the number. It is also about increasing the powers and increasing the responsibilities of local government. One of those new powers, one that has been spoken a lot of, with perhaps not a lot of understanding of, or maybe even realisation of the potential of, is that of community planning. And I think this is a very important vehicle through which councils can take a real hands-on approach to improving the economy, the environment, and uh, just the, the, the social health and well-being of their own areas. I put environment in, in the middle there. I think it's very much a central plank of what new councils could and should be doing. As regards the plans or, or the powers that have transferred to them to allow them to do so, local councils clearly have within their own gift uh, the ability to have their own waste policies, which many of them do, and they're working together in their new councils uh, to formulate waste uh, policies that are not, not only prove good value to the ratepayer, but also help us as a NIPLC meet European <coughs> targets. I think also as well, if you look at the estate of local councils, the number of public buildings that they have, the number of vehicles that they own, I think all councils will already be looking at on purely a cost-saving exercise as to how they can reduce energy use. I think very much as well any potential new build by any of the councils, we should be putting pressure on them. I don't know, can I do so legislatively or through regulation that they should be carbon neutral buildings. Commissioner Anna Lou. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Uh, very much welcome Minister's announcement of reviewing urgently the H297 and also uh, introducing the Climate Change Bill. Can the Minister be a bit more specific about the timescale for bringing in the Climate Change Bill and also if he's going to put in targets? for mitigating measures? I, I thank the, the, the member for that question. Well, I, I spoke earlier of, or re referred to the fact that the clock was ticking on, 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 in my office or in my time. And it, anyway, therefore, work is already well underway. The, the groundwork necessary to proceed with legislation. Over the past 18 months, to two years, I have been involved, as of my officials, in extensive and intensive discussions with representatives from a, a number of sectors, from agriculture, from industry, from the environmental NGO sector, and uh, from uh, officials from other jurisdictions as to how we could and should best progress uh, any climate change legislation. 
The, the challenges facing us here in the north, while not unique, are certainly uh, they certainly differ from those in other jurisdictions within the, the, the UK. That's why I think it's important that we look at the Republic of Ireland as we uh, share very uh, similar economies, shall I say, given our, our similar dependence on agriculture, for example, and therefore I think we have to work closely with them and look at their uh, incoming climate change legislation when shaping our own. I think it's vitally important that we as a department don't do so in, in, in isolation, and therefore the input from those sectors to whom I referred earlier is and will be vital. I, the ball has started rolling. It's important that it keeps momentum, and that I keep my, my shoulder to it. Mrs. Pam Cameron for a question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number five, please. The ARC 21 planning application for the development of a residual waste treatment facility at High Town Quarry, Mollusk, was submitted to the Department on the 27th of March 2014. The application was accompanied by a voluntary environmental statement. Consultations were carried out with a wide range of statutory bodies, including NIEA, Antrim Borough Council Environmental Health Department, Transport NI and the Public Health Agency. Following receipt of the comments from consultees, a request for further environmental information was issued to the agent last July. The further information was submitted last September and was advertised in the local press. It included further information for NIEA, Environmental Health and Transport NI. Consultations were issued to the relevant consultees and all responses have now been received. I am aware of the very high level of objection to the proposal. There have been 3,258 letters of objection to date, the main issues raised being visual impact, traffic impact, health implications, odour, noise, house values, proximity to residential areas, economics, tourism impact, environmental impact and the adequacy of the environmental statement itself. No letters of support have been received to date. This regionally significant planning application is still under consideration, and my officials are currently in the process of making a recommendation to me through a comprehensive development management report. I will fully consider all relevant material considerations, including the views of local objectors, before making a final decision. The operating permit application is also currently being considered by the Department, and all statutory consultee responses have now been submitted. It would be remiss of me to make any further comment until officials have concluded their deliberations. Mrs. Cameron, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer so far. I understand that he will be reluctant to comment any further, but would he agree that given the vast amount, and he's outlined the 3,258 3, uh, objections to date, um, of public objection, and the obvious lack of infrastructure um, at the High Town site, and does he agree with me that it is wholly uh, inappropriate for this development to go ahead? Well, given uh, my stated reluctance to, to I'll elaborate on my earlier points. I unfortunately cannot agree with uh, Ms Cameron uh, uh, as she has requested at th this stage. As I said, the amount of objection to this proposal is unprecedented, I, I think, uh, during my tenure as Minister. However, the number of, plan of objections to planning application is not and never can be a determining factor when assessing an application. However, I have given an undertaking and a pledge to consider all material uh, considerations of which the objections, or at least very many of them, w w will be. I, I think that's very important. The, the, the member's reference to the infrastructure, which she perceives to be in inadequate, is one that has been raised in, in many of the 3,000 odd uh, objections, so that's something that, that I'm sure will bear close scrutiny from Transport ANI, who are, are the relevant consultee when it comes to uh, assessing such issues. Mr. Danny Kenna. Actually, thank the Minister. Um, 
for his comments so far on it, and, and I'm glad he's going to take on board all the objectors' comments. But would he clarify the position on funding for ARC 21? I think there was 50 million or 51 million that was in your budget um, from the finance minister. Uh, I thank the, the, the member for that question. Well, I was delighted when I heard I was getting a bonus, <laughs> 50 million pounds, put in, inserted into my budget uh, by the environment minister or by the the finance minister. Sorry, uh, 50 million pounds that I had never asked for. However, then I, I discovered what the 50 million pounds was for. This is 50 million, or 50.5 million to be precise, pounds of financial transactions capital money uh, from the Treasury, which th they seek to identify privately fi financed projects w w which the government can finance and then have the money repaid at a commercial rate. It had, has, is their view that ARC 21 could be one uh, such, such project. However, <laughs> it cannot be in the absence of planning permission or a successful application for their operating permit. With that in mind, I had actually raised objections to the fact that that, that, that money was being put <laughs> into the capital budget of the department, who would ultimately be responsible for making the decisions on both the planning and uh, permit applications. However, w w we still have it. If the approval isn't granted, that, that this money could become available to other projects. If not, it will, will be taken back, but at, at no loss to this department or, or any other. Well, Mr. Alban um, again. <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister uh, for his uh, previous answers. But just in relation to the point that's been just raised about the uh, 50.5 million, uh, if the, if for some, and I, I, I'm this without prejudice to the minister making any decision, but if for some reason uh, the ARC 21 project didn't go ahead, uh, is the minister saying that that 50.5 million could at some point go back to Westminster uh, if there's no other uh, project in which that money could properly be invested? Uh, I thank the, the member for that uh, supplementary question. The allocation of financial transactions capital is to the DOE. The FTC fund is a treasury loan. It, it is that it's a loan to, su to support delivery of major infrastructure, and it's being administered on the treasury's half. It's just being administered on the treasury's half by a DFP. Any loan, as I indicated in the early answer, must be repaid at commercial rates. DFB has assigned, as we now know, that 50.5 million from the fund to the DOE budget to assist delivery of the ARC 21 project in the event of the Waste Management Group submitting a satisfactory business case and reaching financial close. However, in the event of that not happening and, I suppose, a failure to identify a similar major infrastructure project within that department, it's my understanding that that money could well go back uh, to the Treasury. Now, I don't know, would that money become available to another major infrastructure project that might be coming forward under the umbrella of another department, but that's something I, I'd be very keen to explore. Well, Mr Oliver McMullen. Uh, following on from the Minister from the Review of Public Administration, what role does ARC 21 now have in uh, addressing waste management? Sorry. Following on from the Review of Public Administration, what role now does ARC 21 have in, uh, in addressing uh, waste management? Uh, ARC 21 is one of three. Uh, waste management groups uh, uh, across the north, comprising of a number of councils, as each of them do, and it will be very much up to the councils themselves as to wh what role is played by the, the waste management groups. Uh, I have gone on record before 
a thing that I believe we should certainly be considering the move towards a single waste authority for all of the north, rather than the three groups uh, comprising of the various councils. I, I, I think so for many reasons, not least because I, I think uh, a lot of these proposals that have been brought forward, and I'm not singling any particular one out, have been fuelled as much by competition <laughs> as anything else. As I said, it's very much up to the councils to decide how to proceed in this, but I, I, I do meet with councils regularly and, and the Regional Waste Management Board. Uh, they're, they have strong opinions on this. Uh, not always wrong opinions on this, but, but always uh, strong opinions on this. And again, work is ongoing with the councils to decide the best way forward. Waste is a massive issue, and it's, it's only now with the spiralling cost of managing our waste, I believe, that it's getting the attention that it does deserve and certainly require, not just across the councils, but also within uh, this chamber as well. That ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Mr. McAleer. Um, as the Minister aware of reports uh, highlighting last week's Ulster Herald that raw sewage may have been leaching into the River Strule for two weeks, and has his department taken any steps to investigate and remedy the situation, given the serious concern this raises for uh, wildlife, uh, public health, and agriculture of the Strule and indeed the wider foil basin? I, I, I thank the member for that uh, question, and, and, and this r report is one that would cause huge concern uh, to the public around those issues that the <coughs> member identified, and also cause huge concern to me and my departmental officials. The incident to which the member refers was first reported to NIEA on the 8th of April, and a local inspector investigated immediately. The inspector informed Northern Ireland Water about the problem. They then carried out work to remove the sewer blockage that had caused the overflow of the sewage and led to it going into the water course. It is understood that there were difficulties, however, in gaining access to the site. NIEA classified this as a low severity incident with localised impact on the river stool itself. I am not saying that the low impact is, is no impact, however, fortunately, due to the swift reporting I suppose, of this incident and the swift reaction to that report, a more major incident was avoided. Contrary, however, to the report in, in the local press, the Ulster Herald, it was DOE and the Northern Ireland Environment Agency do not have a role in maintaining rivers other than in securing improvements in water quality. NIEA will investigate water pollution reports and encourages the public to do so in a timely manner on our confidential pollution hotline. I would give you the number, but that wouldn't be confidential then. <laughs> call Mr. Magalier for supplement. I thank the Minister for that response and for the clarification. Uh, in the second incident, uh, again highlighted in the local press last week, there's a there's been, um, the carcass of a calf has been dumped in the Rayla Burn outside home a number of weeks ago. Would the Minister agree that this is reprehensible behaviour of the people that dumped it there? And would he also agree that given the public health concerns, it's entirely unreasonable to expect the local landowner or indeed any member of the public to, to attempt to remove this themselves? I uh, certainly uh, echo the, the, the member's sentiments uh, around this act, and, and it certainly should be condemned. However, the NIEA or, or DOE has no role in the removal of fallen animals. However, a number of other bodies do have responsibility. Local councils will, or they certainly should, lift and dispose of fallen animals dumped on council-owned land, roadsides, car parks, laybys, etc., and between the high and low watermark on beaches. In adopted water courses, the rivers agency may remove fallen animals if river flows are impeded, where flow is not impeded and the fallen animal is a public health <coughs> issue, as the member outlined, they certainly do tend to be on occasion. It would be a local council responsibility to ensure that appropriate action was taken. Fallen animals dumped on private land, however, they do become the responsibility of the landowner. 
Local councils can serve a notice on the landowner to dispose of the carcass if it is a public health nuisance. Riparian owners on either river bank are legally responsible for the river up to its central line. In the past, some local councils have removed fallen animals from private land, and I know Derry City Council have, have been good at doing so in, in the past. However, local councils have no legal remit to undertake this function and would seek indemnity from the landowner when they have to. Call Mr. Ian Milne. Um, Minister, could I ask you what discussions you have had there with uh, local sand extraction companies uh, with regards to plan permission in Loch Ney? Uh, I, I thank the, the, the member for that question. I uh, initially became aware of the issue on Loch Ney. I think it must have been as recently as last summer, maybe, maybe the, the, the start of last summer, and I have had regular and incessant correspondence on it ever since. Um, uh, the I suppose, practice or industry of strand, sand dredging, uh, as it is known, has been going on in the Loch as far back as the 1930s, at least, possibly beyond. And, as I said, no one has raised any issue with it or objection to it until very, very, very recently. It's, however, given the objections that have been raised and the serious nature of them, uh, they are not ones that have been taken lightly by any means. I have uh, issued an enforcement letter, or sorry, DOE has issued uh, an enforcement warning letter to uh, many, if not all, of those involved in the practice of, of, of sand dredging and continue to monitor the situation. I must say I am also aware and have received correspondence from those involved in the industry, their dependence on it, their many employees and their families' uh, dependence on it, and the fact that they have been doing it for so long, and if they have been doing it so long, just how harmful can it be? So it's going to be a, it's a, it's a very difficult issue of balancing the environmental and economic concerns. However, given the re very real threat of infraction proceedings uh, fr from Europe, we have to ensure that we do everything correctly and ensure that the environment is being protected. Mr. Milne, for supplementary. I ask on cool your eggs, my my wake is done. Eric, done a fragrance. How can you do so? Minister, I understand, uh, but uh, you know, you say there, you know, that uh, ha there's concerns, you know, from other uh, groups. Could you express to us, you know, what those concerns are? Because, as you have said, you know, there's been since the 1930s, and there's no regulation put in place. So why now, Kermagut? Uh, well, like, uh, I did say, the concerns raised are very real ones, and, and they do centre around the impact on. Habitat. Uh, this is something that is coming from Europe as well. We have to maintain standards in certain habitats, of which the lock is one. Uh, therefore, the threat of, of infraction proceedings fr from Europe is very real, and it's one that we cannot afford to be, as a region, in any way blasé about. Because if a, if a huge fine comes along with that infraction, then we will all uh, know about it. Uh, it is my understanding that those working in the sand extraction business are working together you know, uh, collectively to bring forward a planning application, uh, an environmental impact statement to, uh, uh, I suppose, regularise the work that has been regular to them for, for almost a century. And, and, uh, that is something that we have encouraged them to do, and I have subsequently Encourage them to do a bit quicker. Call Mr. Stuart Dixon for a topic of question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Minister, you recently announced uh, £1 million from the carrier bag levy or tax fund. Can you guarantee that this money uh, will go to current NIEA grant funded uh, organisations and that those applications will not be lengthy or torturous, given the fact that many of these organisations are under a great stress at this point in time? I thank the member for that question. I can guarantee the member that that money will be spent in a way that maximises the protection and promotion of our 
environment. I cannot guarantee that it will go or be split on a pro rata basis among all the environmental NGOs who have been funded to date. I believe a, a, a piece of work is required and is already underway uh, with the sector themselves, with those NGOs uh, affected and others, like uh, independent environmental experts, for us to prioritise where that money should be spent. I can assure the member that this will not be an arduous uh, process. Time is of the essence here, and I, I think it's vitally important that we get the certainty to these organisations that they and their um, employees need. We'll be looking for, for very carefully through this process about how the money is awarded. I spoke there of environmental priorities, but we'll also be looking at issues at, at, around how much match funding our funding actually enables some of these organisations to draw down, and some of them are excellent at it, as well as, I suppose, value for money and, and the volunteer activity that uh, some of the organisations uh, can, can generate as well. It's not going to be an easy task, but as I said, it's one that we haven't got a, a lot of time to do. Well, Mr Dixon for a supplementary. Thank you, and I'd like to thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, in addition to £1 million, you, do have a, you have further funds available in the Carrier Bag Fund. Will you be using that to create a challenge fund this year, or would you not be better actually diverting all of those funds to support those NIE organisations with which you have a service level agreement? Well, uh, there, it is projected that we will have a further in the region of, of 500,000 500, possibly 550,000 uh, pounds uh, from the, the, the carrier bag levy. However, it is my intention at this stage to use that as a challenge fund to make available to community groups, to schools and to other organisations to run their own suppose, low level environmental uh, projects, but while they are low level, they, they do and can have a huge impact. This money has been generated through the carrier bag levy. It states in legislation that money generated through that levy must be spent on community-based uh, uh, projects, which is restricted uh, very much how we can look at, at reallocating it across the, the, the NGOs. I understand the point that the, the, the member is making and it was in fact considering uh, front-loading that money that it was going to set aside to run the challenge fund later in the year to now and then wait for money to become freed up through the VES and use that for the challenge fund. But I'm going to resist doing that. However, I spoke there of the, the, the piece of work we're doing currently to see what projects we're going to continue funding and the rate at which we're going to continue uh, funding them. And uh, again, depending on how that exercise goes, there is a possibility that I, I may have to dip into the challenge fund. I'm reluctant to do so, but it, it may become a necessary evil. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, could you update this House on how you feel the new super councils will conduct their new responsibility for planning? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I, I thank the member for that question. I have every confidence that the new super councils will embrace the, their new powers, particularly the planning uh, function, and use them to deliver for the citizens of their respective uh, council districts and, uh, and areas. I do know, and I've spoken of in this House before. The, a, a certain nervousness that existed, not just among councillors, but maybe a, a across other sectors, about the capacity of our, our new super council ORs and councils corporate to deal with planning issues and, and, I suppose, the controversy that follows and contention that follows many of these planning issues. However, I am confident that the capacity building programme that had been uh, secured by my predecessor through funding he received uh, from the executive. The capacity building programme has been very successful. I know it has built councillors' confidence as well as competence 
some counts, different councils have, have, have spent that money differently. However, I know from speaking to councillors from across the north that many of them are happy with the training that they have received. Obviously, there is no training as good as learning on the, the, the job, so I have no doubt that there is a lot of learning to be done, but I have no doubt that a lot of learning will be done. Ms Dobson for a supplementary. Okay. I welcome, Minister, your enthusiasm and thank you for your answer. You will be aware that delays in applications for businesses and homeowners in the past have led to frustrations and missed business opportunities. What guarantees can you provide that the new system will operate more efficiently than what we saw in the past? Well, I am unaware of any inefficiency that has existed within the system over the, the past couple of years. Anyway, no, well, I think it's important to realise, or that we all realise, that we're not talking about a brand new function here. While it will be new for councillors to be decision takers and decision makers, the staff, the now council staff who will be bringing recommendations to them, are the same staff who have been bringing, uh, bringing recommendations to council under the guise of DOE planning service. We have transferred over 400 highly competent and highly qualified staff to the 11 new councils. The department, of course, retains an uh, overarching responsibility for plan and policy. There will be, without doubt, a lot of hand-holding to be done, but it, it, it's important that that hand-holding does not become handcuffing and that we are too restrictive on the new councils and their ability to, to make their own decisions. On that very positive note, I am pleased to say that time is up and members will take the reins while we change the top table.